I was in a rut with my work and I just needed help. It was almost like therapy in a way, <laughs> I think, that, that last mentorship. It was me wanting to... Just, just getting very cautious that I'm going in a loop. Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Pierre Sondergaard. I'm a texture artist in visual effects. Welcome to my podcast. Let's be honest, a life and a career as a working artist can be very fulfilling, but it's not for the faint of heart. It's filled with challenges and obstacles, and the path forward is not always clear or simple. On this podcast, we discuss all of this openly and honestly with experienced artists who have already walked that road. That's why I call it the Naked Texture Artist. There are many podcasts that focus on and celebrate all the big achievements in visual effects and animation. But my career as a texture artist has not been one unending victory lap. So personally, I'm more interested in learning how my fellow artists handle the hard things, when things don't work, when things break, or when we're expected to produce the impossible. All of that stuff that takes place behind the curtain. So I invite you to join me on this journey. Hopefully together we can learn from the artist who went before us, save ourselves some scars and some tears, and increase our joy as working artists. Welcome to the Naked Texture Artist. Do you know Adam Capone? Probably not. Yet, I'd wager he is the most famous texture artist of all time. In our sister industry, the games industry, he was a really big deal for a while. How many other texture artists do you know who spawned a worldwide phenomenon? How many other texture artists do you know who have had a major feature article in a mainstream publication like Wired magazine? In the art world, or any arena depending on looks, where there's a lot of posturing, a lot of trying to appear cool, a lot of second guessing what will be cool next. But Adam walks to the beat of his own drum, which is of course the coolest thing of all. But I think he, like all of us, likes the idea of being cool, but that's not why he does it. He simply doesn't know any other way. In my lifetime, Adam quite simply has the purest voice, the strongest source of raw creativity I have come across. You might not like his distinct flavor, but you can't argue with his strength and purity. I suppose this will become increasingly clear. These episodes with Adam Capone are absolutely a love letter to my friend and a remarkable artist. A remarkable artist that most will never know. Here's a chance to change that. I heard Sir Richard Branson, who started out the, in the music business with Virgin Records, saying about Mike Oldfield that he was the greatest musical talent he had ever come across. Yet today you'd be hard-pressed to name more than two songs by Mike Oldfield. Some of these pure, raw, creative talents often don't come well-equipped for the other more cutthroat aspects of life as an artist. Jerry Seinfeld said about Michael Richards, who played Kramer on Seinfeld, that he has the biggest and best comedic instrument he has ever come across in his career. Michael Richards came under Jerry Seinfeld's protection for a decade, so to speak, and so we all came to benefit from his talents until that arrangement stopped and Michael Richards has since pretty much disappeared from the world stage. Meeting Adam Capone at University of Teesside in 2002, where we were both studying for a degree in games, art and design, I had hoped to become the Jerry Seinfeld to his Michael Richards. Basically, if I had those proverbial millions of dollars, I would put a team together around Adam and tell them, do whatever he tells you. But life didn't play out that way. 
However, I knew and was worried about Adam since I felt he was particularly ill-equipped to deal with all the other non-creative stuff, which is sadly also part of working as an artist. With the right lucky breaks in life, I was and still am certain that he could be the next Tim Burton. But life didn't play out that way for Adam. All the same, my admiration for Adam is undiminished, and I can't wait to share him with you. I think you'll find him fascinating too. If you are an artist appreciating that raw artist stuff that makes artists artists, then there is a lot for you in this conversation. I promise you, Adam is a diamond worth digging through a bit of rubble for. How's it going, buddy? It's going good. It's been a while. I want to say last time, last time I saw you was uh, when we met in the canteen in Sony, right? In yes, London. Yes. Yes. You back in was London. Just after after hours or something, and you you came in. I think I had some games for you or some other paraphernalia. Or I something. must have been visiting London for some reason. I, I want to say that it was in the streamline days. So you were back from Holland or does that sound right? That could have been when I got, uh, when the studio shut down and I had to suddenly come back. It would have uh, been in 10 or 12, 2010, 2011, maybe something like that. I don't know. That would have been, yeah, around 2000 and uh, 11 sounds about right 2012 something like that yeah and and here you are uh i'm you know adam not happy i'm just gonna bring this up and then we don't have to talk about it anymore. okay okay you you came to montreal without seeing me i'm like i'm mr montreal you know oh that was on a work thing i had to, yeah i was on a work thing oh okay i just for saw like it. one if <laughs> no two days I, I, I saw there. I saw on Facebook that you you photographed some murals literally around the corner from where I used to live. Oh you know? no! Uh, oh, uh, uh. I, yeah. Maybe that. I didn't realize you were in Montreal at that time. You've been moving around quite a bit, right? Ah, you think? Uh, well, I so we were in Montreal from let's see. I came to Montreal in fifteen, and uh, then we left for Toronto in. 18 i think and came back to montreal again in 20 and, right and then we've been here since so i just i just needed to take a year in in an english province to get my pr sorted because as you know the quebecers here they don't like uh, foreigners it takes a while to get that pr sorted out eh? it, I mean, if you're in an English province, it's like six months tops. If you know what you're doing. Ah, two years. Did it really? Yeah. Okay. It's just Maybe. backlog. Yeah, it could be. Could be. So how are you doing? I'm doing good. I've got a house now. Um, ah, you lucky so-and-so. Been in a job for 12 years, so I should be grateful for that. Um, what else? got a girlfriend what about didn't you have a cat at one point we got a cat yeah two oh, years wow. old figure awesome so yeah things are things are good i'm healthy um, and, and when you had your camera on there i uh i noticed the discreetly placed uh wacom Cintiq there very expensive piece of kit just just sort of like just a little in the background there Look, I've, I've actually it. got a, I've got a better one in front of me. Oh, oh, yeah. you did that. That's just the one yeah. you put the, <laughs> yeah. the one you put the dirty laundry over or whatever. Yeah. you know. I, I should have really cleaned that up, but ah, uh, so you you have doesn't matter now. You can't see me, so you have multiple antiques, huh? Uh that's actually my girlfriend's. Uh, oh, or, or you have one each. That must yeah, be nice. Yeah, hmm. it's a shared office space. I see. So the the, the 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 games industry is paved with gold. I take it. Uh, during COVID, we started doing something where they, yeah, they give us some money towards uh, office equipment. Really? So I've got uh, yeah. Okay. Um, 
like every year, like a certain amount, um, not not that crazy amount, but you know, uh, goes towards the bills. Um, so I got a standing desk recently. Okay, I bought a standing desk for my own dollars uh, in, in IKEA. They can they're not that expensive. You know, you can get decent ones there. Oh, mine cost about twelve hundred. Wow, you're really uh, my goodness! You're big time, Charlie. You're yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> wow, I don't know what to say. I didn't know you had that kind of dough. Well, good for you. I thought I was doing well. Well, but uh, thanks for putting me in my place. Oh, sorry, Mark. <laughs> no problem. I'm. I think honestly, as you were saying before, you've been working steadily for many years without interruption that's really nothing to sniff at in neither in the film industry nor in the games industry you know uh i think yeah I think it's strange i had an eight month stint at frontier um so that was short-lived but other than that yeah i've had um it was about five years of streamlining and I've, i'm coming up to 12 at ubisoft yeah that's that's unbelievable. I don't think any of my gigs in film have been longer than I had two years in a bit with the studio and then the studio went bankrupt. So, you know, what can you do? I've also I've, I've had a couple of times I've been given staff roles where where it's not a time limited contract and something else comes up bankruptcy, whatever, whatever things like that gets in the way. And then you're just like, OK, back in the grind again, you know, looking for the shorter gigs and but but by and large, if I'm looking across the time I've been working, if I'm looking at the empty weeks where I didn't have a job, they've been very few. So I, I as long as you're ready to roll with the punches and change teams and projects and pipelines and all of that, then you know you shouldn't really complain. No. Well, you know, Mark. I mean, I'm, I'm sometimes wonder if it, if it would have been better the the other way around, where I did have like loads of different jobs and like just to gain a lot of experiences of different studios um this way i've kind of like limited what i've done i think overall over a long time i mean there is something to be said for that but it, of course you you are in nova scotia and there might not be all that many other gigs going there but if you no. are like i literally moved to montreal because i knew it was the most job yeah. hev heavy area in the world um, so that, that makes that possible. When I was working before the studio I'm working for now, I was working for ILM out in Vancouver and there I would come into contact with these old timers from, um, or OGs as they are from, uh, from San Francisco, uh, the San Francisco studio of ILM. And it's so weird hearing these people talk. They've worked 20, 30 years for ILM, you know? And they just came out of high school or college or whatever, got a job with ILM, and that's where they've been ever since. And they that is amazing in one hand, on one hand, but on another hand, I'm also like thinking, hey, you know, this whole world that's outside of ILM, you have no idea about what tools and pipelines are used out there. You know, it's sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse, but you you they have no idea. You know, which is a oh sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so so it's that that thing. It's it's the double edged sword, you know. It, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was watching a GDC talk that came out a few days ago about uh, juniors in the gaming gaming industry, and um, there's been a real shift since uh, 2015, uh, where juniors now are just not expecting at all to stay at a studio for a long time. It's now more about moving around. Is that good or bad? Well, how was that presented at GDC? Was that was that in a negative light or in a positive light or just a that's just how things are? Uh, I think it's just wanting to, like younger people. Like, there's clearly like a need now to that you need to move around. I think it's more the expectation of young people coming into the industry that they're, they're not expecting to stay. I think they would like to stay, but I don't know that because I don't, I can't read their minds, unfortunately, but uh, mm. yeah, I would be curious to know why that is. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I suppose it also reflects the world that we live in. You know, every I find project planning in visual effects, maybe it is the same in games. It's everything is so much more short term, short term, short term. You know, the sort of the longer term perspective is largely gone in terms of uh, developing the things that takes a longer time to develop. It's sort of it's just not you don't use time on that any longer. You know, I was talking to yesterday, I was uh, I was interviewing uh, uh, one of the guys from the team that brought Thanos to life in the Avengers uh, Infinity Wars and Avengers uh, Endgame. I don't know if you watched those, but that big uh, purple dude, he uh, he really was uh, breaking the mold for a, what should we say, fantasy character in terms of uh, realism and 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 uh, the fidelity in 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 the capture of the actor underneath so to speak and and there's so many aspects of this and and that development work that they put into it before they even started doing the work in in earnest you know like the actual sort of like this is what he needs to look like on 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 in the shots uh they put a lot of work into just basically getting a I don't know, what would we compare that to in the games industry? Maybe a games engine that has certain features, getting that developed before you even start looking at, now we need to make the content for it, you know? And it's a very different long-term perspective than what you see a lot of the time nowadays, I find. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. It sounds similar to uh, the, I don't know, I, forget, I keep forgetting the name of the Ubisoft engine. Snowdrop, that's it. Uh, they've got like a custom engine and uh, yeah that's just taking you know it's taken many years to develop uh, to try and get to a state to where it can really uh, be effective do you remember uh, do you remember a million years ago you sent me a physical letter no we had left university and uh, after some sort of general flapping about and uh, time wasting, um, which I continue to do, you eventually found yourself at uh, Streamline. And the big sort of question for anybody that's attending school is sort of like, oh, what, what, what's the professional world going to be like? Well, what is it going to be like, you know? Yeah. And, and you basically sat, sat down and wrote me a paper letter. It was the loveliest gesture, basically to tell me, this is what it's like, you know? This is how we do it. The whole concept of like your the routines of your working day and and the sort of interactions with supervisors on a regular basis for reviews and and what have you. All of these kind of things being assigned uh, tasks and how it all works. You know, you were explaining the the, the the workstations that you work with. That you, I remember you said that the graphics card was so powerful that you didn't need to render. It would just show on screen with the on screen visualization in, in good enough quality that there is no point in, in taking a closer look at a render, for example, you know, and uh, you were describing all these kind of phenomena to me. And it was it was it was a it was a great view. It was a great eye opener, a sort of a great window into a world that I still wasn't a part of. But I was standing on the outside of that world just with my nose squeezed flat against the glass, you know, thinking, what's it like in there, you know? I, I don't know if you remember, you talked about the death zone. The death zone, as you described it, was when you get an asset, okay, you put in the first uh, first uh, pass or whatever it's called, and then eventually that will come back from review and you have now notes to do on that. And then, But in the meantime, you've also gotten a second asset you need to start on, and that might even be a third and so on and so forth. And then all these extra tasks that are coming back from the previous assets are now adding to your workload on top of the asset you're already working on, which is has not had its workload sort of decreased, you're expected to turn that into the same bit time, like let's say it's two days or three hours or whatever it may be, irrespective of all the other tasks of fix this little thing there, fix that little thing there from the previously reviewed assets. That's what you call the death zone, that basically you just running fast and fast and fast and you can't keep up do you remember that i don't remember this and the first, like the thing i'm just coming straight to my head is like why why would i write a physical 
letter, but um, uh, <laughs> well, you did address that in the letter. You said something like it was a skill from your caveman days that you hadn't used for a while. Okay. With uh, physics. Maybe maybe I saw that as a novel thing that you, that you yeah, were yeah, about yeah. these days, would you? But no, um, it, it's sort of, but it was the hipster choice, you know. Uh, yeah. Back to uh, old technologies. Trying to be unique. Uh, the death zone. What I that, honestly, that's not a term that I remember. Um, but what you're talking about does vaguely ring a bell. It kind of it, it's what we're doing now. I mean, that still happens. Uh, but in the form of Jira tickets, uh, where you're just getting a bunch of tasks and then things are just constantly coming, coming back, or you're just what you you just find yourself with extra time that you want to spend on older tickets. Have you gotten Have you gotten better at managing that death zone? Because I I I still I meet that now in the visual effects world. You know, you get notes. On your assets, whatever. I mean, it's basically the same process as whatever the terminology is. And at the same time, you're expected to produce uh, on time this other new asset while all of these things are also supposed to be magically produced or questions answered or, you know, notes addressed uh, while you're, you know, in the same time frame without extra time being allocated for it. I've got better at it i think it's a big part of it is just understanding um like iteration and just not getting bogged down in in the details um there's there's often a thing i've brought up before where uh, so i tell a artist you know can you model a car in one minute and like often you'll get a surprise that no of course i can't do a, a car in one minute but but you absolutely can uh it you just make a cube you get two cylinders that's a car it, and yeah it's a it's a terrible terrible car but it is a car that the producer will be happy with I mean, you know, in terms of like getting a task done, the producer might not like the quality of the car, but then you, you know, that's a conversation that you go back and forth with and try and find that right limit. Um, I suppose com producers in in my world they calculate everything in spreadsheets, so they're perfectly happy with that. They look at time spent, done, yes or no. That's all. You know, yeah. quality. That's not their remit. You know. Um, that's a different story. I, I actually use that similar idea of the one minute car. Like when I'm given a, an insane task that needs to be accomplished in no time, I'm like, okay, you're going to get the one minute car. Then that's what you want. Yeah. Sometimes you, that's all you can give, but, uh, it, it's that triangle thing, isn't it? What is it? Quality budget time. Yeah, exactly. And you can't have all three of those. One has to give. That's true. That's true. And and the answer is, you know, what ones to choose is just per project. It depends on the situation. Well, I wonder that such a letter today, what would that letter look like if you were to send that to me or yourself or I don't know, a cousin or nephew or, you know, some somebody like somebody you cared about and you're just like, okay, these are the this is how it is. These are the, these are the, uh, let me show you the ropes. You know, I wonder if there's any changes from when you started out. So this would have been, this would have been like, I mean, it's not 20 years ago, but it's well over 15 years ago. I think now you'd just give that person like a YouTube video that covers it because there's so much resources out there now that kind of explain this stuff or you put them forward to communities. Uh, like Discord community, I use a lot. There's, you know, back in back in our day, <laughs> I sound like a really old person now. Yeah, yeah we're going we to just have uh, Polycount, you know. 
what's the other one uh 3d org or something did you uh, did you never went to cg society or C yeah see the cg society um that was a 2d place but i think there was a a thread for 3d wasn't there yeah there was yeah yeah for sure the the, uh, the wealth of information and how accessible it is is just unbelievable i mean i I, I, I don't understand how we managed to learn anything before YouTube. It's just how, how I mean, I, you literally had to go to university as we did in order to just go through some very basic tutorials, I have to say, uh, compared to what is available for free now. It's, it's unbelievable the spread of information there is right now. And if you are willing to spend money, you can get mentorships uh, with one on one with an actual pro. Um, so that is in a way is kind of like sharing your knowledge with someone else but you have to pay for it but yeah if you've got a friend then uh, i'm sure they can distill that to some information is that something you used um mentorships over time or have you been have you been mentoring people i've took a mentorship with someone else a few times okay was it was it worth you feel it was a value for money yeah, it was just really good being able to talk with someone that had a lot more experience with what I was in need of. Uh, so it, it, one at first it was very more technical. It was just, you know, I, I was wanting to get better at uh, substance. And then the second time it was actually, I wanted, I was in a rut with my work and I just needed help. Um, it was almost like therapy in a way, <laughs> I think, that, that last mentorship. It was me wanting to, just just getting very cautious that I'm going in a loop of just creating substance materials. And I realized that I needed to just get out of that and just, start creating more larger environments and pieces of work. Have you ever been a rut? Lost your way? Continuing a loop that no longer has any or the same purpose? Where does it come from? I think it comes from the focus we have and that we need as artists. We need that to do our work, but it also leaves us a bit myopic. When you combine that with the rhythm of the work we do, which is quite repetitive, tight deadlines means constant work where you barely have five seconds of downtime for reflection as you quickly change from asset to asset or shot to shot. And when one show finishes, a studio scales down staff, and then you may be thrown into a full-scale job search to find your next gig. Again, no time for reflection there. It all amounts to a life cycle where we have little opportunity to just have a moment to take a breath, clear your mind, and simply ask yourself, where am I? Where would I like to go? What do I need then to do that? So we can be stuck continually carrying out a plan, so to speak, that no longer serves any purpose. It was maybe what you needed to get to where you are now, but it might not be what you need to get to the next level or the next step of your journey as an artist. Or worse still, we might be exhausted from that whole constant grind so that we simply lose our way as artists. We've lost that spark, that love, that was the reason we did this in the first place. It's been beaten out of us or worn out of us, and we just robotically... Repeat the steps we've done so many times before because we simply don't know any better. How do you break free from this? How do you get out of it? I think we start by acknowledging that what got you here had value. You did this for a reason. You did this because it was working for you. Dwight Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces during World War II and later President of the United States, had this thing he said about commanding armies and winning wars. Plans are worthless, but planning is everything. 
I used to take exception to this quote because I love to draw up a plan, polishing and perfecting it. How dare you call my beautiful plan worthless? But now I get it. The German Field Marshal Helmut Molke said that no plans survive contact with the enemy. And that is true. No matter how perfect a plan is, very quickly it will become obsolete as you carry it out in the real world. Which is why you must keep planning, keep adjusting your plans, keep plotting a new adjusted course to where you want to go as you push forward. Because the ground under your feet will keep changing and shifting as you travel. That's what Eisenhower's quote means. And as artists, we may have this activity that we really need to practice as beginners that makes sense for that moment in time. But to keep on in that loop stops our growth from reaching the next stage. What got you here is not what will get you to the next level. We have to remember that. Sometimes we do need to be told that because we can develop a fondness for whatever our pet activity is. Why not? We might get good at it over time. That always feels nice, even if it has stopped challenging us any longer. And it is often something we can tell ourselves that we're being productive when we do this. And the more familiar we become with it, the lower stress it will be to do this activity. So imagine an exercise in the gym that was challenging to you once upon a time and now you can enjoy this stress-free gym life of easy exercising which you tell yourself is helping you get fitter. Except it is, of course, just deluding yourself. So what to do? I don't have all the answers, but the way I see it in order to discover that next step, you do need something that we maybe don't have access to. Breathing room and friendly senior artists. I've often said on this channel that on a psychological level, creativity comes from our emotional core. And when we are caught in that rut of next task, next task, next task, I think that part of us gets numb or it falls asleep, or it atrophies. In any case, it stops working. To bring it back online again, you need to stop and feel, which takes time. Time unobstructed by other requirements. Feel what still works for you and what has lost its usefulness. Feel where you want to go if other constraints were no hindrance. Feel what art you still yearn to make. To be honest, it's hard to do. And it takes time and space to get anywhere. For that reason, I ha always have a journal with me at all times, particularly when I'm on vacation or if I'm traveling somewhere. Long journeys are great because you're locked into a state of inactivity and you have to leave time and space for your heart to dare to peep up over the parapet, particularly if you've brutalized it for a long time. Then in the beginning, when it speaks, it's barely audible. So I don't expect to be hit by a lightning bolt, which is why I carry a journal to jot down any and all little thoughts that may come to me. Over time, they often crystallize into a bigger, more coherent whole. The second thing that is really valuable is trusted other people. We do so much of our work in our heads. We live such a large part of our lives in our heads. For something it is a strength, for other things it is also very limiting. So to get out of our heads and away from that myopic focus, where all we can see is the task in front of us and not the whole picture and of how our lives fit into that, we need to talk to other people. We basically achieve triangulation, which helps us find our way and pinpoint our location on that great big map containing our lives and our artistic journey. Then we can clearly see how far or how close we are to where we'd like to be. Mentors are great for that. A friendly senior artist at work would work too. Or a friend from school who works in the same field as you can do the trick too. 
put that sincere question of, I feel stuck, where do I go next, to them, and see where the conversation goes. Being an artist is in nature a solitary endeavor. Being a commercial artist is often a rushed and non-stop life. But we need to step outside of those two to see the light and move past the obstacles that come our way. I think I think I'm I'm sort of thinking about this that when when I was at university when we were at school together I sort of imagined that the professional world would be this fantastic place where everybody was so excited about what they were doing and all you're going to be talking was like a big slumber party where you just stay up late talking about Texas all night or whatever it may be you know everybody's so excited to just talk about this and by and large I haven't really found that I you know, these things that you're talking about here, I feel like this is something you should just be able to get or do in your workplace. Just, hey, the next desk over, you know, the next guy over, hey, you know, what do you think of this, uh, you know, or there's like a conversation like that that just flows around the room on a constant basis. But it's not really like that. It's um, I, I, I actually do have that at work. Um, we have weekly what they call one-to-ones where you can just you just get in a room with someone and you just talk for uh like half hour hour and that's it's more to do with your personal growth and career stuff and you can bring those kind of subjects up really yeah and That's... that's really uh been great so who would you talk to? Would you t- would it always be a supervisor or would it be an equal or an under underling or whatever? It, it's always uh, your manager. Okay. Wow. In, in my case, uh, art director. I have never, ever come across anything like that in the visual effects world. I, I feel like that's a mature uh, process to have in the workplace. I'm surprised. Yeah, it's that... really great. I'll have it everywhere. Yeah, I feel like that, that should just be standard wherever you go huh so where are you on ai have you uh have you are you are you lying in a corner rocking back and forth while sucking your thumb or have you started uh, wrestling with it i'm kind of it just excited about it i i think i'm very like cautious of it but at the same time quite excited there was a really good talk uh gdc recently about that that i mean i've listened to loads of these talks but this one in particular just really resonated very well with the gaming industry in particular so some of what i might say is kind of coming from that but uh i agreed with a lot of the information um so the core concept is that the last it's really the last 20% of a task, which is what is going to set studios apart. Uh, just, it's almost like substance in a way, like substance designer, you know, you create your your base. And then if everyone just submitted that base, every studio, there would be no competition, but the secret is really just being able to really be good at that last 20 percent so the ai does the last 20 percent or the first 20 percent uh sorry it would do i would like eventually it's going to be the majority of the work right it's going to be like 80 percent not now but in the future i i think it's going to just keep improving and instead of spending like two weeks on the whole hundred percent you're spending two weeks on the 20 percent okay yeah i can see that i can see that that it gives you really gives you like a solid base and beyond and you polish the last little bits of it but that last 20 percent like you're gonna have to be really good at you know you're gonna have to know a lot of like traditional skills to really give you that edge against the other uh against other people but but it's also really as i said like exciting because for example there might be an environment where there's loads of like a bar and there's loads of bottles 
And I've had this before, something similar, where you've suddenly got to become a graphic designer and knock out a lot of different random designs very quickly for logos and brands. Hey, in a, in now, a pre- previous life, I remember an Adam who, who knew a thing or two about <laughs> a, gra- a graphic design. I, I know, I spent five years yeah, doing huh? a graphic Didn't you? design. I, I, yeah, I remember you had a pretty snazzy website when the rest of us were just like fumbling around like cavemen. Well, that was a waste of time. Now everyone just has a standardized uh, site. So, it's anyway, balanced. sorry, I'm I'm taking you off your your thought there. But yes, regarding the how the the concept of being able to just have AI create these designs for you, and so you it takes away the more boring mundane work uh so that you can concentrate more on the fun exciting stuff i think there's something to be said for that Uh, and for example ai creating materials there's there's already a website that is doing that yeah where you can just say like what type of material you want you want and it will create it uh, it's not very good, but you know what? It's actually f- very useful for placeholders so that it helps you block out levels very quickly. Ultimately, I think the it, it's coming down to you. It, it favors jack of all trades. And in in the past, I've seen large projects that will, in the credits, will have... Some, uh, wheel artists as in artists that just specialize in creating car wheels car wheels yeah and, and you know those very specialized kind of uh, tasks uh, or jobs rather are going that I mean that's going to become something that's I feel like you know like the first thing everybody does when they're it seems when once they learn to model and texture a little bit and whatever you know what they do they make handguns or they make cars and i i i I feel all the handguns that ever needed to be made has already been made why are we making more Uh, same surely for car wheels you know like why is there a need for more i mean like they must already have been made sure organizing that that make sure that you get the wheel you need that that might be lacking but you hey if ai could take that job okay i think that frees up some valuable resources Ex- except of course for the poor guy that's now you know in space nobody can hear you cry crying about uh all the handguns that he was dreaming of modeling unless it's sci-fi guns yeah. uh, um or sci- sci-fi tires rather i i like saw a documentary on grand theft auto the making of and uh, Grand Theft Auto 2 has a sort of sci-fi element to it and it was going to be a lot more sci-fi but it actually got pushed back to realism just because realism is faster. 2 was still the top-down view right and then it was in 3 that it sort of became all 3D that we how we know it. Yes. Okay. Realism and, is faster. Yeah, realism is definitely faster, right? Because it that content already exists. Other people have made that content. And it's the same with textures. Whenever I go to uh, mega scans or what all these different asset libraries, when I look for textures, they're, 90% of them are photo real. There's hardly any uh, stylized. And when there are, there's not many stylized you know there's one type of photo reel but there's thousands of stylized well then when i see uh, when i see a mid journey and the other sort of uh, dali and these other uh, ai engines uh, generating images they seem to have a distinct style to them even even when it's supposedly real i feel like i can sort of like see the hand underneath that there's certain style decisions that are made that it gives them a very similar look. I don't know if I'm alone in that. No, there's very different um, builds. I, I, I have to confess, I'm not. I haven't really 
done AI or deep dived too much into it, but um, I, as I understand it, there's different um, builds that you use that have different styles. So apart from AI, what does the future look like for for uh, an artist in your role over the next five, 10 years or any number of years? Do you see I've any other trend? No idea. It's, it's too far to see in the future. I, yeah, what would it look like in 10 years? Um, I think it's going more and more and more towards procedural. Uh, not just procedural texturing, but procedural modeling, uh, procedural uh, get moving into the engine. Um, I'm just seeing a lot of ways to uh, cut corners, but use that extra time to make your games look even more amazing. Uh, limitations and optimizations are really starting to go away now. I'm often told, don't worry about the uh, vertex count, but do worry about the material count. Really? Mat that, yeah, I mean, materials like, still cost a lot. I, as as you know, I'm obviously I I never I never got into games development, so I studied for it and had that mindset of optim optimization and and the limitations that you need to work in. But I I'm completely out of touch with where are we right now? What is possible in a game engine of current generation? What are the you know, obviously you're saying some things are important still and other things, whatever, forget about that. That's We don't even count that any longer. I mean, when when we were learning, you and I, it was, you know, poly, count, poly counts in the tens of thousands, I think, was our first modeling assignment. Do you remember that castle? Yeah, yeah. That was, that was uh, limited to 10,000 polys or something like that. And once we started using textures, what were they even? Were they 250 uh, times 250? Maybe? I don't know. Maybe it was 256. Less. Yeah, pop that sounds about right for that time. Yeah. I mean, so now I'm working in visual effects, which is a different beast altogether. There is no poly counts. There is no texture counts. Uh, as long as you can manage to render it, I mean, like you could kill the renderer just by overloading with so much data that there isn't a computer strong enough to... Nobody's going to thank you for that, that's for sure. And you're, you can see how your the render times per frame will go up into many, many hundreds of hours, and nobody's going to be happy about that. You know, So you are trying to optimize like that. But obviously, I'm, I'm not aware of where the game space is right now, so this is very interesting to me. Well, the latest thing is uh, Nanite in Unreal, where the count really is become a thing of the past it's just irrelevant but um that hasn't reached through to all other engines but that you'd have to think that's coming if unreal have started this then others will follow so you're jealously eyeing unreal 5 and just like uh oh, when are we gonna get these features um i'm actually using unreal 5 a lot uh for personal work okay. Okay. Uh, but not that work. I I have been sort of, it's been on my list of, I feel like I have this endless list of always need to learn a bit more set brush, always need to learn a bit more, you know, Unreal yeah. is now also on that list, you know, of these things. I need to learn more Spanish so I can speak with my Spanish in-laws. I need to learn, yeah, whatever. These things that, uh, this, uh, this self-inflicted guilty conscience that we have. Yeah. yeah, I recently got a house and it's like, oh, now you've got to learn like gardening and all this other stuff. Hey, don't uh, don't knock gardening with the growing with the food prices. You're going to you're yeah, going yeah. to be so smug. You're going to be smug, you know, like when you're yeah. like uh, bringing all the vegetables in. Yeah, I'm going to have to like just learn how to do caulking DIY, that stuff that I've kind of neglected because I've spent all my time in my youth learning how to uh, do Dynamesh and ZBrush or whatever. Yeah. Ah, uh, thank goodness there's uh, tutorials for that on on YouTube too. Like I was uh, changing a, a light, uh, you know, like the light switch in the wall. There are tutorials for that too. It's amazing, and you look you look pretty good while you're just like effortlessly doing it. To uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. So no more dynamics for you. What do you have, have? I don't know how you see your your work and your life as an artist. 
do you sort of like have goals or sort of an idea of progression mapped out over time or you sort of you have an idea for in so many years i'd like to be more whether in terms of skills or the type of work that you do or do you have do you have sort of like a progression mapped out for yourself or are you just flowing with it and just seeing where yeah, you end up so strange um like i for the longest time i i put off like becoming a senior i i never why? like brought it up and i why? just why would you because it i'm not very good at presenting or teaching or mentoring or that's what i thought at the time um i also worried that it would take time away from my magnificent art but and then i kind of got that opportunity and that was like a switch i so i don't know i don't know what the difference between seniors in games industry and and in film is but in film the senior just does really cool stuff but is still not involved in all the paperwork of being a lead you know the meetings the all the organization all that kind of stuff so you still get to do really really like oftentimes the coolest assets you know yeah yeah i mean it is expected that if you got some juniors on the team yeah take them under your wing and you know be helpful whenever but it's not formal like that is is that how 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 does it work in, in the games industry for you it depends on the on on the uh, studio uh in my experience uh the senior will yeah get get the cool assets or whatever but it, it's more about that they then have to start mentoring others uh mentoring the juniors so you you were reluctant to step into that well, what changed your mind i was just blank out like asked like you, you should be doing that <laughs> you should be doing this like we can't go any longer without you uh helping out we need you to be able to help other people you know yeah. it, it just got to that point and they're just like uh come on adam you've been here for 15 years it's <laughs> about time <laughs> <laughs> and i wasn't reluctant to do it when asked like i you know agreed straight away but i i think i just needed someone to say hey we've got a faith in you let's let's see how you do i i do think that's important because for for those of us that and i think we share that that we're not political people you know you have other people that are incredibly ambitious and they're just looking at okay exerting dominance and gaining prestige and rank and what have you and all of this is like they're the gears are turning in their head constantly uh, i feel very uncomfortable with that so you do need it's nice to be asked you know just yeah that, that sign of faith in you and just to be asked like that instead of you sort of your ego is brimming over and you're just grasping for it yourself yeah i recently had the opportunity to be art director what uh, yeah so, so my art director uh went on man i can't even think of the word maternity maternity, maternity. that's yeah. the word, that's the word or paternity uh, or... so yeah i helped out for a year as uh art director and that that was also a really good experience for me because it kind of made me realize I never want to be an art director. So, and I, I, stop here for a moment, Adam, because you know what? Already back in university days, I sort of like when I'm sort of I was closing my eyes, looking at you and sort of imagining my your your trajectory in life. I figured now there is a guy that would be a good art director. And I, I, let me quantify that uh, uh, a, a little bit because you just had a fantastic source of creativity your ideas you had so many of them and they were so original and they were so vivid do you know it doesn't mean everything you do is is gold but there was so much of it that you're so you could you, there was a high ch a chance that some of it was gold you know and and that versus just being sort of a rank and file kind of artist that where you were just doing the legwork and carrying out somebody else's vision i i always saw you in that role i always saw you as that sort of you are the source that a project is formed around i i could always go back to it for sure um it's just in like right now it's just not i feel like i've got so much more to learn 
as a artist. The the issue with the art directing was just that I wasn't very good. I really tried to hang on to the keeping my environment art tasks. So I still wanted to do like 50%. I was still the environment artist and then the other 50% was the art director. Whereas really like a good art director just really needs to focus on being an art director. Yeah, I can I can see that it, that that role would have enough in itself. Um, you know, you you wouldn't have enough time to also uh, do do your old work, so to speak. Yeah, right now I'm lead artist, and I feel like that's the right balance for me right now. How so? That means now you're sitting in meetings and and doing paperwork and things like that, right? Yes. Yeah. How do you like it? I've I've grown to like it. I like organizing. Uh, I like creating documentation. Um, as long as it's around what eighty percent art, twenty percent the manager stuff, then I'm okay. Yeah, that sounds like a reasonable split. I I yeah. would I would buy that too. I'm 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 worried depending on studios and projects and whatever that it might be much higher than that on the on the management side of things and much less on the art side but yeah that's I, that's, really... that's a good split yeah so over the time over so you've been you've been a working artist for well soon 20 years right or there about yeah coming up to 20 years i'd say yeah what have you learned about your strengths and weaknesses as an artist Adam Capone will be back in a future episode. Thanks for spending a little bit of your day with us. We have a tiny bit of housekeeping to do on the way out. If this episode has been helpful to you, why not share the podcast with your colleagues and friends? If you'd like to support the podcast, I'd appreciate if you bought me a coffee. You can do that on coffee. That is spelled ko-fi.com forward slash the naked texture artist. One word. If you have suggestions, comments, or questions, I'd love to hear them. Feel free to drop me a line on the naked texture artist at gmail.com. That is the naked texture artist written out in all one word at gmail.com. As I mentioned, having a busy day job in visual effects means my release schedule for this podcast can be a bit irregular. So if you don't want to miss out, subscribe to the naked texture artist wherever you get your podcasts or Follow the podcast on the socials, then you'll be alerted when the next episode drops. The music in this episode was Awake by Tycho. Nick Sifoni helped put the sound together. And everything else was done by me, your host, Mark Pierre Sondergaard. Speak to you soon.